Thanks very much, uh, Eric, for that introduction and for arranging this luncheon. As uh, many of you know, Eric is an accomplished and entertaining writer of fiction and nonfiction himself, and in his day job, a brilliant strategist for companies and, and individuals in a variety of crisis situations. I'd also uh, like to take a moment to recognize my wife, Donna, who is here today, who is in grade school during Watergate. <laughs> uh, Donna holds it all together for our family and has suffered through uh, many uh, weekends, family vacations, and holidays of me scribbling away on a legal tablet writing this book. In The Emperor's New Clothes, I write about five different matters that I have been involved in, one in each decade from the late 60s up through uh, the present, involving the intersection of law and politics. A unifying theme is the presence of hypocrisy and hubris in varying amounts in the, uh, by those in positions of authority, and the challenge of overcoming unwarranted secrecy in order to achieve some measure of accountability. I am very much the product of the New York City public school system, where we learned in the aftermath of World War II the values and ideals that America stood for and how the world looked up to us. My mother, who had a difficult childhood, as a foster child from the age of five, instilled in me an appreciation for fairness and the importance of standing up to bullies. So at not yet 25 years of age, when I found myself as a very young and idealistic assistant United States attorney, suddenly invested with the power to issue grand jury subpoenas, it might have been analogous to handing a three-year-old a sharp pair of scissors, but not quite. It was my incredible good fortune to be hired by Robert Morgenthau, the legendary U.S. attorney and for the last uh, several decades, the district attorney of New York County, and to be surrounded by colleagues who mentored me and taught me by their example the proper boundaries of the exercise of prosecutorial power. Initially, I, I gravitated to the prosecution of organized crime and labor racketeering cases. This could be very heady stuff for a young lawyer. Indeed, I remember how full of myself I was when my picture first appeared in a New York tabloid. My cousin Stan called me from Brooklyn. Hey, I saw your picture in the Daily News today. I said, uh, oh yeah, it was an important case, and I began to expound on the case when he interrupted me, saying, yeah, I was riding on the subway, and I looked down, and I was standing on your face. <laughs> this was an epiphany for me. Um, it taught me that the press can be fickle, that fame is fleeting, one day you're up and the next day you might be down. And so, simply to keep uh, my eyes focused on the professional challenges and to try to keep a sense of humor about myself in the process. Bob Morgenthau's only marching order was to do the right thing. He put these words behind his action when he authorized his assistants to investigate an influence peddling ring run by a New York fixer by the name of Nathan Velocian out of the office of Democratic Speaker of the House John W. McCormack, the most powerful legislator in Morgenthau's own party. A chapter of my book deals with my involvement in that investigation, first as the most junior member of the investigative team and later as the chief prosecutor of the case against McCormick's administrative assistant, who was ultimately convicted of conspiracy and bribery. Incredibly, Velocian, a New York lawyer and longtime friend of McCormick, 
spent three days a week installed behind the desk of McCormack's district office in the Rayburn building, using the influence of the speaker to benefit a long list of his clients, from convicted mafiosi and stock swindlers to corporate executives with serious SEC problems. What got my particular attention was how young men drafted into military service during the Vietnam War were able to get hardship discharges from the military on the basis of fees paid to Velocian and the exertion of political pressure from the Speaker's office. This despite the Speaker's hardline stance as an ardent supporter of the Vietnam War. The hypocrisy and hubris of political figures violating their public trust has held an enduring fascination for me. Clearly, The Emperor's New Clothes by Hans Christian Andersen made an indelible impression upon me as a child. In my fifth year at the U.S. Attorney's Office, I was invited to travel to Washington to interview with Archibald Cox, the newly installed Watergate Special Prosecutor. Let me read from my first meeting with Archie Cox. Archibald Cox had a reputation as a stern and forbidding legal scholar, self-righteous and unyielding. His roots and background were about as different from mine as anything I could imagine. My interview lasted 15 minutes. Professor Cox's appearance, tall, ramrod straight, with close-cropped steel-gray hair and clear blue eyes, did nothing to suggest the slightest connection between us. The starkness of his office, freshly painted white and unadorned with anything on the walls, to personalize it, was of a piece with his unfashionable gray suit and drab, narrow necktie. By contrast, I wore my hair in the longish, contemporary style of the early 70s, particularly unflattering in my case, <laughs> given its tendency to frizz up at the slightest mention of humidity. Summer in the reclaimed swamp that is our nation's capital is synonymous with humidity. I was wearing a wide paisley tie, equally contemporary and an equally unfortunate fashion statement given the benefit of hindsight. Photographs of me from this period evoke spontaneous gales of laughter from my daughters. If my appearance was disconcerting to Cox, he gave no indication of it. It was my good fortune to have been hired by Cox and to be associated with Jim Neal, Jill Wine, Stephen and Chuck Breyer, and dozens of extraordinary lawyers who were my colleagues on Archie's staff. Let me quote again from the chapter. Nixon pegged Cox as part of the Eastern elite establishment, a Kennedy man at that who was out to get Nixon. The reality was much different. Cox was bent on providing a fair investigation that would withstand scrutiny by any objective observer. On several occasions when we updated Archie on the progress of our investigation, our boss questioned us closely on the appropriateness of various investigative techniques. It was not enough to point out this is what prosecutors do, but is it fair was the bottom line question to which Archie always returned. So to some extent, we were obliged to reinvent the wheel and think through issues I had never questioned. I developed a tremendous admiration for Archibald Cox and what he stood for. Nixon, on the other hand, was playing by different rules. It was only mildly surprising that having recently prosecuted the Democratic Speaker of the House's administrative assistant, the Speaker having decided not to run for re-election, that I was soon included among the partisan elite Democrats out to get Nixon. Nixon's imperial view of the presidency and personal insecurities had worked to encourage a competition among his lieutenants to cater to his dark side. 